All right, good morning, RPG Limit Break. How are we doing today? My name is Moon Blaze Wolf. You can call me Blaze, and I'm going to be your host for this next run of Legend of Mana HD Remaster, Fairy Storyline by Lemur. Uh, Twitch chat, I don't know if anybody has told you lately, but you're looking really cute this morning, so keep it up. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, go ahead and give everyone an update. We have a couple bid wars that are going to be closing pretty much right at the beginning of this run because they are related to uh, the character creation. Uh, we have a uh, choose main character sprite incentive, and that one is very close. Hero is currently in the lead at $100, uh, and Heroine is in second place at $75. So you just, this is probably last call for those bid wars. If you want to influence those, get a donation in. Also, naming the main character. We haven't updated this one in a little bit. We uh, have a current leader of Port of Subs at $51. Uh, and in second place is Jeff, with an exclamation point, uh, at $50. So again, those are going to be closing very, very, very soon. Uh, so make sure that you get your donations in for that. We also have a bonus incentive for this run, side with Dana. Uh, during the Starcrossed Lovers quest, we need about another $850 for that, and it is about an hour or so into the run, so we need to hustle on that. Let's get some donations in. And I have been told that we are ready to kick things off, so it is time for Legend of Mana HD Remaster, Fairy Storyline by Lemur. Take it away. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Hope you're having a good time and are ready for some Legend of Mana. So quick introduction, I'm Lemur, the majority record holder for this game. And joining me today are two great commentators. We have Quixel, relatively new to Legend of Mana, but a longtime speedrunning veteran, I'm sure you all know. Hi everybody, looking forward to commentating this amazing run. And then also we have Mechalink, another runner and one of the head routers for this game. Hey everybody. So without too much more, we can get into this. Uh, I did my best. choosing, hero or heroine? Let me give it one last refresh here. Uh, we had some late action on that. Heroine is the winner of that uh, bid war. Yes. All right. I put some action in on that early, I was hoping. <laughs> $275, by the way. So thank you very much. I will read the donations associated Ooh, with that as soon Good as job, I can. Everyone. Name time. Uh, the name is going to be Port of Subs. Uh, the P, the O, and the S are capitalized. Yeah. Those not in the know, that's a, uh, a sub place near the RPG Limit Break venue. Port of Subs. Mm -hmm. That's it. Look correct? Yes. Port of Subs. OK. Just get lined up here. And I'm ready for a countdown. We're still on this map. Nice. All right. Uh, I'll count you in. Uh, three, two, one, go. <clears throat> All right. So I guess a little bit about Legend of Mana and its speedrun. Uh, Lom's an action retro RPG with beat em up and pseudo fighting game combat, and it also has a world building map system. So, those two things are a big part of the speedrun here. It focuses on efficiently executing combat and having good movement both in and out of battle, and then using a very intricate map system to best create the world for your category. So, um, this time we're going to be running Fairy Percent and uh, Wixel, do you want to explain the kind of differences between Fairy Percent and the other categories? Sure. Well, like uh, Lemur said, Legend of Mana is it's very different from the other Mana games that came before it. It's more of a, it's an open world game where you build your own world, and then <laughs> instead of kind of a long, continuous storyline, you get involved in these um, shorter quests called events. And then in order to finish this game and get credits, you need to place 18 lands on your world, and then you also need to finish one of three main story arcs that uh, in total maybe about like a, a, between a quarter and a third or so of the events in the game fall under. And then for speedrunning, that's how we, um, how we kind of delineate the shorter categories, which of those three story arcs you use to get to the end game. And then uh, Fairy Storyline is the, uh, it's basically the second quickest one after, um, dr after Dragon Storyline. And, um, and then the other one is Jumi Storyline. 
And then which, which storyline you do changes the speed run in very, very significant ways as far as what dungeons and towns you go to, what bosses you fight, uh, what, what kind of weapons you use for optimal combat. It's, it's a really, really deep and uh, fun speed game because of all the options it has for you. Yeah, and then there are even longer categories where, called All Stories where you do all three of them. And then All Events where you do all 78 events in the games. And you know the time goes up larger and larger. And with the HD remaster, we have a platinum percent now as well, which is over 10 hours. All right, so Lemur picked up his first artifact, which are basically generally given to you as quest rewards for finishing events, so that you're given the, the color blocks for the town of Domina just for starting the game, and use that to create his first land on his overworld, where he's gonna be uh, um, picking up two more artifacts here, because you kind of get, you get two choices for where to go next, basically, after starting the game and going to Domina. He'll be getting both of the artifacts, but he's only actually gonna be kind of completing one of those new quests in full. Yeah, um, as... As Prexel mentioned, we, we need to get 18 lands, and getting that extra artifact is going to be part of it. And then something you're going to be noticing right away, too, is um, what's called wiggle running, which is a, uh, a bit of speed tech that Lemur is going to be doing all throughout the game. And uh, just, just kind of like the name implies, he's basically alternating diagonals on, um, on his analog sticks, because this game does, does support 360-degree um, movement through analog controls. And it was a little, it was a bit more significant on the original PlayStation version of the game, but it does still save time on the HD remaster too, to just like kind of like do this movement that you're seeing here. It's 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 pretty challenging to optimize, I can definitely say too, because um, in addition to kind of trying to alternate your diagonals as fast as possible, you're also trying to do it while avoid bonking into walls and corners, because like especially like on the zoomed out map of Domina and some other places like that, it's very easy to. Uh, if you're holding, if you're trying to wiggle run kind of the wrong way, you'll you'll run you'll run back where you came from basically yeah. and waste some loading time. Yeah, there, there'll be, for example, coming out of that top exit there, right? Like you might think you can go right, not quite, not as much as you'd like, and that kind of stuff happens all over in this game because of the mix of sprite art and uh, kind of HD art. And that was the case in the PSX version as well. Yeah. And I cannot, I can never gush enough about just how gorgeous looking and sounding this game is too. I mean, it's got this just beautiful kind of storybook art style to it, um, along with uh, just a killer soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura. Yeah. So Lemur went into the uh, to the to the to, to the bar basically to get the Jade Egg artifact. And then um, he's getting the wheel artifact here. Like I said, we're going to be put, we're going to be putting down both of those artifacts and if to, as part of our eventual goal of getting 18 to access the end game. But uh, as far as what we're going to do right now, we're going to put down the wheel to create Luan Highway, which is going to be our first dungeon area in the run. And even this placement is relevant. We're placing it two away from home, uh, which raises its level so that we're going to be getting more experience than we would if we say placed it closer to home. Um, so even this early, the placement is matters for the XP routing. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be getting more into it as the run mm -hmm. goes too, but just where, where lands are placed on the overworld has a lot of impact on the routing. Yep. All right, so we can probably start, uh, I guess, Lemur, did you want to talk about the combat at all, or did you want us to take care of that? Yeah, so entering into Luan here, it's a pretty simple first dungeon area, you know, you just head right, but it also shows off a lot of the main combat thing we'll be using, which is spin attack. So you kind of saw right there, I had to position myself below the three enemies so I could hit all of them at once. This is pretty much the only, well, the only um, standard attack we have that can hit multiple enemies. And so we use that to kind of space out a lot of these combats, getting them done as efficiently as possible. Yeah, and then doing spins is very, very technical, actually, a lot more than it looks, because you're noticing on a couple of these fights that um, there's these yellow stars appearing over enemies, and that's, that's kind of the, that's the general intended purpose of spin, is that you can, the yellow stars mean you can stun enemies, but if you do it enough times, you might risk getting stunned yourself. But um, fortunately, kind of the radius of actually hitting with your spin attack 
compared to um, getting the yellow stars aren't quite the same. So for a lot of fights with mobs, you can kind of thread the needle as far as getting damage in without risking stunning yourself, which, is, which lasts for a couple seconds. And then we, obviously that's a bad thing when we're going fast. Yeah. And we also saw the first use of an ST, a special technique there. We used Blammo to clear out the, that high HP crowd down there. Uh, there's the bar that's blinking below our char right next to our character portrait is when you have your ST bar full and can use such a technique. Yeah. Another quick thing to point out too is that um, Lemur is picking up all of the item drops that he can from these fights too, just because he's going to need to get get a bit of money relatively soon to uh, uh, to purchase an upgraded weapon. And um, since we're going to be giving away all of our loose cash at the end of this quest, um, we need some items. So a little micro optimization there with dashing up and down to get Niccolo to catch up faster. Uh, this cutscene before we have Mantis Ant, our first boss, who uh, you might remember from uh, Smelly McTroll's run of Secret of Mana yesterday, but um, it's Moonlighting is the first boss of this game, too. And then, uh, I guess, Mecca, do you want to talk about jump canceling? Right, so uh, you can, as you can see, we're doing those heavy swings, and then we are quickly moving into a, a, a uppercut. We can do that because we can use the jump button to cancel that heavy animation. And this allows you to hit faster than you would if you were trying to just chain heavies additionally. Ooh, oh, so SC, close. So close. Um, but the other thing about if you're using heavy moves with a slow weapon like the hammer, you have three moves and then you are stunned for a good second or two after the chain, right? And so by doing these power cancels or these jump cancels, you keep yourself from getting stuck like that. Yeah, and if just doing just... Normal heavy swings. There's about like a second and a half long recovery yeah. animation at the end of it too. And there's a, there's a couple tricks up our sleeve as far as canceling out that animation. But yeah, I mean that was a that was a pretty good fight overall. I mean yeah. it's, you have to get a little lucky in order to kill Mantis Ant before it does a it does its own special technique. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean almost had almost had the quick kill, but uh, Mantis Ant had some other ideas. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I should have been a, a tad more aggressive with my spin attacks there, and I think I would have been able to stagger the fight out a little bit longer. Got a little bit greedy, though, and ate that mm -hmm. ST. Yeah, and then also there's a little, there's a mostly random time savings we can sometimes get at the end of this quest, too, as far as having enough money to buy the, those junk items from Niccolo. He'll give them to you anyway, along with the next round of artifacts, but if you just get enough money drops to be able to just afford it, then you just cancel a few text boxes. All right, so we're placing the jungle in another sequence. Uh, and the jungle is an area that's required for the quest, uh, for this very quest. Um, we'll have to do a couple things in there. Um, but this is the core of the fairy quest, Gato Grottos. This is where all of the relevant NPCs live. Yeah, it's going to be a little while before Lemur actually goes to the jungle, but he's setting it down now in order to set its land level. Like, I guess this is, since we've got uh, got a little bit of downtime here during this quest, so we could maybe just talk about land levels in a little more detail. Although, are, are you are you doing the shopping now or later? Uh, I'm going to do the shop now. Just okay. To be sure. Uh -huh. All right. So well, maybe we'll do the weapon buy, then talk about land levels, then we can have some have uh, have Blaze uh, give us some news too. So. Um, one of the really nice things about Fairy Storyline as a speedrun too is that um, it doesn't have any like really, really big uh, kind of random gatekeepers to getting a good time. And one of them is that um, the routing works out that all of the weapon upgrades um, that, we, that we use throughout the route, we can just buy from shops instead of having to rely on uh, one out of eight drops from enemies like in uh, Dragon Storyline. So right there, Lemur basically just sold off um, Sold off a bunch of the item drops he got uh, from Luan Highway or, fr or from Niccolo at the end to get. Uh, you, you need at least 200 to buy the Iron Sword. Um, if you get if you if you get a lot of drops, in particular Clear Feathers, which sell for 125 and can get, end up with a lot of money, that cannot you can use that to optimize uh, the next weapon buy we'll be doing later on. Um, so yeah, and then um, I guess Mecca, do you want to talk about uh, the land system? Uh -huh. That's right. So the the simplest part of the land system, the land make system, as they call it, is that the distance from home and then the number of lands previously placed determine the lands level, and the lands level determines base monster level, and then the big things are base monster level and the um, the contents of shops. 
higher land level shops, which means they were placed later, have better stuff. You know, so this would, in general play, that would make a lot of sense, right? So we kind of make sure that the lands that we're going to be in a lot, lands where there's going to be a lot of fighting, where right? like we want those to be as low as possible, right? Like and that's kind of, the, and then the second level of this will be elements. We might talk about that a little bit later when it's really relevant. Yeah. So kind of this, yeah, just the short version. We want we want places where we're fighting a lot to be low, so that the enemies have less health and lower stats. And we want towns we're going to to be high levels, so that we can buy better gear there. Yep. And I guess uh, I guess Lemur, unless you had anything you wanted to talk about, we could hand it off to Blaze, I guess, for a little bit here. Yeah, this is a good point. Blaze, you can take it away. Fantastic. Yeah, I've got some donations that have come in and some more love for that uh, amazing Shimamura soundtrack. Uh, Doe Wolf donates $50 and says, can't wait for the good old Legend of Mana OST listening party, complete with speedrun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doe Wolf. <laughs> uh, we also have $100 from UA, uh, a $50 anonymous donation, and a $10 donation from Buffalo Theory with no comments. So thank you so much for that. I also just want to remind everybody that this run does have a bonus incentive. Uh, there is less than an hour to meet it, and we still need about $850. So let's go ahead and get some donations in for that. When you're making your donation, don't forget uh, that at the bottom of the page, you have to actually pick the incentive. Uh, it is right before you hit submit, so don't forget that. And uh, what you are donating towards, uh, RPG Limit Break 2022 proudly supports the National Alliance on Mental Illness, AKA NAMI. To get involved in the fight against mental illness and the stigmas it can bring, reach out to NAMI via their state organizations or on Facebook, where they can be found as NAMI, on Instagram and Twitter as at NAMI Communicate. And just remember, it is not a weakness to need help. Please reach out if you think you need help. All right, so plot-wise, uh, as, as, um, not that we care much about the Jumi plot in this, but we've been seeing a little comedy here with Sproutling running back and forth and trying to deal with you know, this, this bug infestation, and it's rapidly turned into a faux murder mystery, but now Rubens is confronting the nun that's been kind of consulting him to do the mean thing, the this, this Sproutling, <coughs> and the faux murder mystery is about to turn into a little more of a real murder mystery. <laughs> Which there's an anime adaptation yeah, starting up right now. This yeah. was um, mm -hmm. not really, you know, a quest relevant to the fairy storyline, but we have to complete it anyway. That's kind of an ongoing theme, and fairy percent is a lot of the quests we have to do are locked behind other quests in certain areas. Right. So like right now we're doing Flame of Hope, and it doesn't really matter that much for fairy, but or for yeah for fairy, but the quest that is behind it is very very important, and right. to access this place is like the hub for this category we need to complete this quest first. Yeah, and that, that's probably the, the single biggest reason why Fairy Percent's about 10 minutes longer or so than Dragon Percent, yeah. is just that there's a lot more prerequisite quests for the actual Fairy quest that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like the Fairy arc itself is actually really short, but you have to unlock all of the lands. That's what we generally refer to, the, this thing where you have to go in and do the, the land itself's basic quest before you get to actually like proceed into the the quest that you want to yeah, do. Yeah, you really notice that if you run all stories too, because mm -hmm. you, you do all the fairy quests back to back and it takes like 40 <clears throat> minutes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you'll see the same thing repeatedly as Lemur noted. Yeah, so we're just about in, done with the uh, with the main cutscenes here. There's there's one dialogue box coming up soon where Lemur's going to pick the second option just to speed up the rest of the cutscene a little bit, and then he's going to uh, head for the... Uh, Dungeon area, which is a pretty it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty trivial dungeon. There's only one required fight. Although we're going to be doing something that's there aren't really a lot of opportunities to do in this game, which is to actually skip a fight. Um, if, if it wasn't obvious by now, um, m most of the fights in dungeons are unavoidable, and there's no way to run away without killing all the monsters. But right here, Lemur can hug the corner and then skip the fight with that trash heap enemy or whatever it is. Moldy goo. Moldy goo. Okay. <laughs> And I guess while, and while we're at it too, um, w once you've killed all the monsters in a normal fight, in order to get the result screen and then move on, you have to either collect all of the drops from the enemies, which is either experience plus money, healing items, or regular items, or wait for them to despawn. And doing both, both of those, both item collection and then kind of making judgment calls on if waiting for a despawn would be faster or... or uh, take some experience to get good at. 
Yep. And you, you might have noticed that we actually didn't even follow the path of leaves that was supposed to clue us in because there's a faster way. So we got here faster than we normally would, but we still weren't in time to keep Sandra from escaping. Escaping via the off-screen Cancun bird, although we'll be seeing it eventually near the end of the run. Sure. This is the this is the category that actually gets to interact with the Cancun bird. Another just quick minor thing, if anybody's wondering too, because um, we had a bid war over whether um, um, Lemur was going to play as the hero or heroine sprite. Uh, those are those are those are completely the same for the purposes of the speed run. Same hitbox, same move set. I think. There's mm -hmm. a few text boxes that I think have very minor differences, and then there, I think the animation when you get out of bed at the start of the game is, is slightly different, but just for all intents and purposes, it's just pick. If you run the game, you can use whichever sprite you like. That's right. Uh, there's a minor time, like there's a minor time loss in the all events category. So if you want to play multiple categories and the longest category, you kind of want to practice mail, but other than that, I like there really is no re no significant difference between the two. So kind of entering the ruins here, we're keeping in line with what we explained in Gato, where we have to do a quest to unlock an area for later. And so that's just kind of what we're coming in here to do, complete this tea time quest, and then later come back and uh, do the quest we need to do. This is an area that I think gave a lot of people a frustration oh, casually due yes. to the little <laughs> gate puzzle up here. Yeah, yes, a lot yes. of people have not so fond memories of going through this place as a kid or even as an adult. Yeah, I, uh, I find it once you get the hang of the puzzle, it's a little bit better. But the first introduction to it doesn't really explain anything. So. <laughs> Yeah, I find it very very therapeutic in speedruns to just destroy this place in like five minutes or whatever, too. <laughs> I, I was here for hours, uh, casually. And yeah, yeah. And, yeah and, th and then, yeah, the, the way the, the gate puzzles Lemur was talking about that we're kind of running into here, I mean, what makes these confusing is that you can't open all of the gates at the same time. You basically just have to pick um, between two, ga two gates, which one is open, which is closed. And the way you do that is by talking to these flowerling NPCs. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of them corresponds to an individual gate. Yeah, the, the key thing to remember if you're trying to figure this out yourself is that the positions of the flowerlings are the positions of the closed gates for the corresponding crossways. So he moved it from, you know, being able to pass through that way to making it a corner. And then here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to, you know, block off the lower right path that we came from so we can make it a corner and get to the bottom left area here. Ooh. Uh, for, unfortunately, getting uh, trolled a bit by the flowerling here. In some ways, those flowerlings uh, walking around near the gates are worse than the actual monsters in uh, mm -hmm. Mindus Ruins, as far as yeah. how much of your time they can waste <laughs> if they decide to. Yeah. On a good day, you can avoid them. You can't avoid the monster fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, there's... Uh, in some cases too, there's you, you can actually take advantage of one of, one of the few glitches this game has in order to clip through the flowerlings, which is mm -hmm. something that'll be a lot more relevant much later on in the run. But uh, but yeah, another thing, this game has very very few glitches. It's very solidly programmed compared to most of the other Mana series games. So the speed run is just really just about playing the game fast, having a really uh, having a smart route as far as how you do your land placements, and then. Just uh, have, getting really good at the combat system. Yeah, a lot of the things that are kind of glitchy, where like aren't interactive to this, they're inside of deeper systems, where it's more like the programmers made a typo than any real significant glitch. Um, so yeah, like there's <clears throat> tempering system has some of those little, you know, mistyped bits in it, but yeah, otherwise there's really not much in the way of of exploits here. And here's here's a drop we're hoping to get. A one in eight chance. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a one out of eight chance of getting a spiral claw spiral claw drop from suplex monkeys, I like to call that uh, <laughs> that that monster, which would speed up basically just this boss fight and this boss fight alone if you got mm -hmm. it. Yep, and we saw yep, we met Duel. Uh, that was the one that Niccolo was trying to sell the wheel. Um, but oh by the way <laughs> There's a bat here. Yeah. All right, so this is Count Dovula, the boss of Tea Time of Danger. And then um, 
Lemur is going to be doing a pretty different strategy for this fight compared to Mantis Ant, which is where he's going to be doing a really long and tight chain of power cancels in order right. to, uh, um, to try to keep Dobula locked down. I guess I don't know if we've actually explained power canceling yet. So the way, the way that works is that, um, like we said, normally there's a second and a half recovery animation when you power swing. But um, at a certain point in the animation, if you press a shoulder button on your controller, which normally you map special techniques to, if you press one optimally that doesn't have a special technique mapped to it at all, then you can cancel the recovery. And uh, the rhythm for this is very tight. He's not just mashing, basically. There is a kind of there is a, a fixed rhythm to doing this uh, as fast as possible. Yeah, you can hear those little honks in between the swings. That's the cancellation noise. And that was that was a good yeah. one too. And that was a great that yeah, was a great fight. Let's, let's applaud for that. That was a really well executed Dubula fight by Lemur. He didn't he didn't drop the combo at all and uh, no. yeah. Dubula <clears throat> crop rate didn't move too far away during the hits. Yeah, and she didn't lag the entire time either, which was nice. I had <laughs> yeah. that in the last practice run. Yeah, that's an that, that is an unfortunate thing about Legend of Mana HD. I mean, it's 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 it saves several minutes, like I think in this category, maybe like eight or so over the PlayStation 1 version because of faster loading times. But uh, a downside though is that um, there's random lag spikes during certain battle animations and that, that that's a big deal for Count Dovula because sometimes after you hit her, she can uh, react by trying to cast a spell and then that'll lag the game if that happens. And, and, and just if that happens a lot, then that, that makes it really challenging to keep the power cancel rhythm going. Yeah. And you'll note that at the end of that scene, we learned an ability uh, for the first time. Uh, and that ability is half of something that we're going to need later. You'll probably see a uh, lemur menu um, to equip that ability at some point shortly. Um, but now we're just getting our plate clean. If you have more than two items, so three or more, on that little artifacts plate, quests won't give you two, they'll only give you one. And that's a problem, because sometimes the, the artifact we need is the second one out of a quest. So, yeah, like, and then most of these lands he's putting, well, I should say about half of these lands he's putting down right now, he's not actually going to as part of the run. It's just for eventually getting to 18 to finish the run. But also it's for leveling up Pulpota Harbor, because like Mecca said earlier, land levels are based on the number of other lands you've already put down and then how far away from your house it is. And then by leveling up Pulpota Harbors right here, we're able to just kind of we're able to duck in and then buy a Laurent silver weapon for um for the hero. So if he'd have got been able to sell more stuff uh, before buying the uh, iron sword, he wouldn't have to sell more here. But that does require getting fairly lucky in the start of the run. Right now he's going to be equipping that sword for a nice attack power boost, along with um equipping some special techniques for the one-handed sword and then uh, the counter attack ability. Right. Um. Yeah. Do, do you want to explain how you learn new skills? Yeah. So there's basically a counter that happens whenever you have a skill <coughs> equipped, one of those top two, uh, you get a, a point in that skill for each normal encounter and for the majority of boss encounters, you get four points. And when you reach a certain level of points in a skill, you learn a new skill. For special techniques, it's points in skills with the weapon. So you have to have, you know, like 10 hammer fights and some other things to get, you know, big bang. You have to have, you know, so many sword fights plus techniques to get you know, cutting bamboo, right? Which we equipped there. And Maelstrom, right? Like, which are, those are gonna be our STs for, I believe, most of the run here. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's how the skill system works in this game. And obviously, as speedrunners, we know what we need, and what we need is those things that we've already done, right? Yeah, we some jump levels that we got in Luan, where I, like, combined with the uh, spin and defense levels. Um, yeah, because the, the, the ultimate goal of the skill learning route for this category is to get the counter strike skill, which is uh, it's a melee counter attack that's just it's one of the highest damaging skills in the whole game. Yeah, and it doesn't really take that much work to get it too. You just need to equip defend, which Lemur did um, in uh, t um, Flame of Hope, to, to learn counter attack, and then equip counter attack, and then you'll eventually learn counter strike. Yep. And yeah, counter strikes is the one we we will need for the final boss. Um, and in Jumi, we also use it a lot. I'm less sure of how often you use it in Fairy. 
Um, the bosses are a little less inclined mm -hmm. to. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically just for the uh, for the, whoever the, whoever the boss of um, Starcross Lovers is, which is ah, actually a yeah. donation incentive for this run too. That's right. The fastest route is to side with Escad, and then Dana is your is the boss, and unfortunately you kill her as part of that. But um, we c we do have a donation incentive for Lemur to side with Dana instead and I, save I her mean, life. It's an easy choice. Do you do you side with the muscly paladin? Or do you side with the morally neutral cat girl? I mean, it doesn't seem hard to me, <laughs> but yeah. I got to donate to get that. Yeah, so this is Hutton Ducate, which, like like several other things, is a prerequisite quest for an actual fairy quest that's in the same area. Um, there's a little, there's some little bits of annoying randomness here with the NPC movements, because like in that last screen, he just went through. It's sometimes possible for Skippy, the NPC, he needs to talk to to go into the loading zone for the next screen, which yeah. is really annoying if it happens. Um, and we are now. This is also another map that a lot of people get lost on their first time through, just because mm -hmm. of how samey everything looks. Not just samey, but it changes as you go through certain points of it. Um, and in fact, right. you can't access Ducat's area until you've talked to both of them and gotten them to team up with you. Don't mention the other. They won't like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that tripped me up when I uh, last casually played this. Yeah, yeah, my casual playthroughs, I remember they're doing the same thing, just like, Don't, shouldn't we work together? And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. But in fact, what you need them to do is work together. You just you did not tell them about it. Yeah, and that yeah. leads us to Ducat territory. Yep. There's been some route changes to this too, in the, within about the past year or so. I want to say we're um, um, basically just putting the putting the jungle down earlier in the route to have it to kind of have it have a lower level at the expense of Mindus Ruins having a higher level, just because you do have two quests here and there's a little a bit more combat overall. Yeah, Mindus Ruins doesn't have a ton of combats. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, Lemur getting dizzied there. Sometimes it's just kind of a risk you have to take based on how the fight's playing out to uh, to just eat the risk of getting uh, dizzied compared to uh, um, try repositioning your character to avoid it. Yep. But yeah, that's that's the risk that we're trying to avoid by doing these long range spins. Yeah, he's a danger, dangerous dinosaur that goes down in three heavies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe we're at the bus now. Yep, the spring of beasts. Yeah, this is Lamer's going to be using the kind of the same general strategy as you did for Davula, but Ducade is much much easier. The mm -hmm. the, the rhythm you have to do for um, power cancels to keep Ducade stun stun locked is a lot looser, and there is there aren't random lag spikes from magic. Yep. Ducate has some cool looking moves, but we don't want to see any of them. And we're probably not going to. <laughs> there you go. Yep. That adds to that death animation, too. Yeah. Just, I mean, look <laughs> at that five, that, what, that 4,500 Lucre just bounce off into the distance. <laughs> and there's Counter Strike. Mm -hmm. So, already done. So yeah, finishing up the, the jungle here, we're actually finally going to go back in and start an actual fairy storyline quest. Mm -hmm. Our first one. Yep. And you'll know. Uh, don't worry. When when you get the when we start it, you'll know. Mm -hmm. um, each of the three <clears throat> storylines has a a special part of the splash screen for for them. And then because of because of I, I believe it's because of having completed Hunt and Ducade. Lemur's going to have access to some fast travel options when he yep. goes back into the jungle to do in search yep. of fairies, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty common with the unlocks, too, is that there's fast travel available, uh, either a, uh, a boink or some teleporter, and it does rely on the unlock. All right, so all that's done. Now we settle in to spin jump for the majority of the yeah. run. And I guess, Lemur, unless you had anything else, maybe we could do some have Blaze talk a bit, too, while we're doing the mob fights in here. Yeah, this is a good time. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, I've got another $25 anonymous donation with no comment, so thank you so much for that. And chat, again, we only have about maybe 30, 35 minutes on that uh, side with Dana incentive and save her life. And as uh, our commentators were just telling you, Dana is an adorable cat girl. I don't know anyone who doesn't want to save an adorable cat girl. So. 
Let's do what we got to do. Let's uh, let's get a train going. Let's uh, hashtag save the cat girl. Let's get some donations in uh, to make sure that that happens. And remember the other thing: we don't actually kill Escod going the other way. Like he ends up hanging out in the jungle like a jerk, but like we don't kill him. The other way around, we definitely killed him. <laughs> So yeah, let's absolutely get to work on that. Uh, we do have some prizes right now as well, if I can entice you with those uh, to get some donations going on. Uh, these are prizes that are available all through the end of the next run, which is Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, any percent. Uh, those prizes are, for a $10 minimum donation, a Golden Sun desk mat. For a $5 minimum donation, you can play a live D&D &D 5th edition game with Bob the Ninja Goldfish, which let me tell you, this is my first RPG limit break. Bob's D&D &D games are the stuff of legends at RPG Limit Break, and I guarantee you, you will have a fantastic time if you win that prize. Uh, and then we have a $15 uh, minimum donation prize for a Lord of the Rings shadow box. And don't forget as well, cumulative donations of $100 throughout the marathon make you eligible to win the grand prize, which is a PlayStation 5, I hear those are hard to get still, with Final Fantasy VII Remake and Tales of Arise. So, Let's go chat, let's get some donations in, let's save the cat girl, and let's raise some more money for Nami. All right, so we're coming pretty much just on the last screen before the boss right now, just one more mob fight after this. Um, oh yeah, get, getting lots of items at this point is good because it makes collecting them to end the fight faster, and you also, whenever you level up, um, that delays the results a bit too. So yep. get, just getting a lot of items or healing items um, is generally preferred, although it's something we have no control over. Yeah, basically, any time you see that level up prompt, you can't end the battle for another five seconds beyond it. So pick up the last crystal, get a level up, you just lost five seconds. <laughs> yeah, so I love the name for this boss too, Punk Master. This is, this is, I believe, our final um, just kind of just straight up power cancel chain boss. And mm -hmm. this one isn't quite as easy as Ducate because it does have, it, it's, 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 it's a little easier, I think, than Dobula, but, um, but yeah, because it does have magic leg. Oh, yeah. Uh, you saw the beginning of that attack that was going to knock us away. And, like, the, yeah, Punk Master actually has an attack that can um, ruin the fight a bit compared to the others. But well-managed <coughs> fight. No magic, no STs, and no knockaways. Almost slipped it up right at the very end. Yeah. There, but luckily, yeah. if you get that last hit in, it, it doesn't count. So. Yep. No, I saw it too. I saw it start to deform your, your sprite, and I was just like, <clears throat> oh, got there. <clears throat> All right, back to Gato. So finally heading back into Gato to um, show off the quest that we had to do Flame of Hope to unlock. Uh, this is kind of like the main exposition of the fairy storyline where you finally start to learn a bit about the feud between Eskad and this guy named Erwin and... Uh, from there, though, it's just mostly exposition. What we're really focused on will be the the end of this segment. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, Mecca, did you want to maybe talk about the characters from the fairy storyline, given that we're getting introduced to pretty much all of them at this point? Yeah, sure. So we have uh, Escod, um, who we will find out about in the text shortly, has apparently been, to the un been in the underworld for the last 10 years, training of the sword to, uh, to kill Erwin. Erwin is a demon that grew up with all four of these characters. Uh, Matilda, who we're seeing here, um, who is, in fact, as the fairies mentioned in the last quest, she's 26, but she looks much older. And then we have uh, uh, Dana, uh, who has been also part of this friend group um, and has been, you know, a monk of uh, a monk of, of Gato for, you know, you know, alongside Matilda for the past 10 years, right? So we have, right now, we don't know where Erwin is, right? Like, we haven't seen him do anything. And we have Escod, who's here to take care of Erwin. Uh, we have a suspicious nun <laughs> who has yeah. a different coloration than every other nun. And we also have what we'd like to see, too, which is minor sequence breaks. Because yep. um, you're meant to go back in there, and then you get a, a short cut scene of the mysterious golden nun kidnapping uh, Matilda, but if you just leave the temple without going back into the dream weaving room, you, you just skip that and move on with the story. And by suspicious coloring, we mean they have the exact, exact same coloring as the fairies that Erwin, or that uh, Escod ganked in the last quest. So, <laughs> yep, surprise, yeah. the fairy-covered fairy nun was a fairy. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, so Two Torches is one of the shortest um, quests in the run. Um, largely thanks to having fast travel to just go directly to the boss room. And now we've got Spriggan. Oh boy, Spriggan. Yep. Uh, there's, there's two bosses in Fairy Percent that um, they just have a lot of randomness as far as just kind of how what their AI decides to do impacts uh, how long the fight takes. And then um, Spriggan is one of them, just because uh, Spriggan both can just randomly teleport around the room and waste a little bit of time each time that happens. And uh, Spriggan also has four of its own special techniques. <clears throat> each one of them has a tell as far as what kind of animation Spriggan does. And um, we might see Lemur get to try to go for what we like to call a counter ST, which is where uh, we, we, we set up our own ST while, while the boss is in, in iframes from its own. There's a teleport. Yep. That, that is actually the player move evade. You could do that too, but it's way less useful for you. <laughs> yeah. Getting some skeleton summons too. Come on. Oh. Nice. Ah, that was good. The skeleton summon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they dizzied me there. I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah, the skeletons were really kind of hassling you this time, but a zero ST kill is that what is, you want to see. That save. is really good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the tele yeah. the, the evade luck wasn't the greatest, but mm -hmm. uh, what we really, really mm -hmm. want to see is no STs. I mean. Again, it is something that Lemur does is able to kind of control his destiny on a little bit because um, um, each each one has a tell as far as what what which of the which one it's going to be, and then it, at some point during that animation, Lemur could queue up a, a cutting bamboo ST to uh, get some damage in of his own. Uh, you don't really use ST. I mean, it's it's a little, a little unfortunate that this game has a lot of really kind of flashy, cool special attacks that um, you generally don't use in speed runs because. They're slow in a lot of cases with the animation, and then because of that animation, enemies or bosses can just walk away and you miss, so you waste, <laughs> waste even more time. But um, doing counter STs, um, if you've got if you've got good timing and uh, and skill, you're able to uh, to get hits in. Yeah, that's all very true. So yep, excellent fight. Now we're placing another land, and here's probably a good point to mention the mana system for land. So I mentioned that distance from home num and point placed are the major factors for base level. The mana levels of a land will then modify bosses and monsters up or down. Right, like this is, we're gonna be facing shortly an earth boss and we have placed the water stuff next to it to lower, to increase the water level, which is the, uh, the opposite element for the boss, to lower its, the boss's actual level, right? So that is a specific case where we're using the land make system, specifically the elements part, to lower the, the level of this boss. And that's extremely important. This boss is, in this, this is, it's, it is an annoying boss. It's not nearly as RNG as the other two, but it is extremely annoying. It just sucks time from yeah. you. It's a really unconventional boss compared to pretty much everything else in the game too. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you, we'll get into it more when he gets there, but just the amount of health that this boss has is, uh, Makes is really, really important as far as how quickly uh, <clears throat> Lemur can defeat it. Yeah. It's because of a really unique mechanic it has. Yep. So now we're headed through the Ulken Mines. Uh, the master of that shop yeah, is... Yeah, the Mines is kind of one of the spots, I'd say, where you kind of exit the early game and enter the mid-game of the speed run. Mm -hmm. I feel like the difficulty also starts to ramp up, too, in terms of the normal mob fights, like the... Uh, how efficient you can be on your spin setups and your position from enemies gets much, much tighter, I think. That makes sense, yeah. I, um, even in all events, uh, we talk about this as a place where, back at the, when, before I started rerouting all events, this was a place that, um, you know, Elevated and such would talk about, like, that these mole fights actually were kind of a hassle with the hammer. Would this be a good time for a couple of donations? Um, let's. How many? It's like what, like one or two more screens? Yeah. So I think. Yeah. Let's 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 uh, let's do yeah, the boss right fight. The boss. Let's do the boss here, and then, it, then we, I think we'll have a little bit of time after that. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the last screen before Laban or Laban. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce it, but the boss is that plant thing on the screen on the uh, ceiling there. And then the, the unique mechanic for Laban is that um, it, it has these um, arms or heads or bulbs 
that um, that descend. And then basically each each arm has a chunk of the boss's health pool. So I think it's six total with the uh, with the land and mana levels we're at now. And if if we if we were to have if the land level were to be higher, we might be looking at seven or eight or more uh, eight or more uh, arms, yep. which um, which would yeah, this placement of time, just but... barely gets the one head loss on this fight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. If the bit... levels one higher, or the mana levels are off by one, then we get an extra head here. Yeah, kind of huh. bad luck too. I mean, you had you got real, a really good opening pattern as far as the red arm not immediately going into an ST, but uh, then this, this, the the the, uh, the, um, the red one's kind of main method of attack is to self destruct, and they're invincible while they're charging that up. So I, I saw Lemur tried to do a maelstrom to try to kill the uh, the red one before it finished exploding, but the timing didn't quite work out. But it did protect him from the explosion. Yeah, which that is, explosion hurts a lot. <laughs> it's a good 80 to 90% of your HP. But that was a pretty good Le Mans mm -hmm. fight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you actually have to chew through a lot more than the 600 HP this spot starts with. Um, each small bar that you saw him chew through on the left, right, like when it started in green, then yellow, then, is 100 HP. So you had to kill, you had to burn down 300 HP for every 100 <clears throat> HP of the main yeah. boss. And then trying to lock down, in particular, the red arms before they start their self-destruct is pretty is pretty tight, too. So yeah, this, this boss has a lot more HP than it should, and it doles it out in very slow chunks. So that's that's why it's you know it's a long slow boss and you mm -hmm. just want to reduce that as okay. much as possible. So I guess, All right. So I guess with that, Blaze, what have you got for us? Yeah, I apologize for my excitement a second ago, um, but I just had some really exciting news I wanted to share uh, as soon as I could. So uh, first of all, going back to the boss fight previous to this one, uh, we got a twenty-five dollar donation from Monocled Unicorn that said, "Good luck with hey. Spriggan, Lemur." Yep. <laughs> uh, hey, we, I guess we, 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 can, we can credit Monocold for that zero ST fight. I, yeah. I mean, I can confirm that donation came in before the Spriggan fight, so it definitely helped. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, a little backstory on that. I have an infamous moment in the community where I died to Spriggan while on really, really good pace in a very hilarious way where I got chain stunned and ST'd and... It wasn't a fun time, but Monocled was there, and he, he really loves that moment, so shout-outs to Monocled. <laughs> uh, we also have a $20 donation from Jay that says, I let Dana die in my playthrough and regretted it. Let's save her. Uh, we have a $35.07 anonymous donation with no comment, and then uh, we have a $1,000 anonymous donation wow. Whoa. with a comment. Donating so that everyone can get the kind of help that I've benefited from. And that is absolutely what we are all about. Uh, we have now passed $45,000 raised for NAMI on the marathon so far. And good, and good news for cat girl fans everywhere. We have met the side with Dana incentive during Starcross Lovers. All right. All right. All right. So we're gonna get the closest thing this storyline has to a happy ending then. Yep. Um, now we're in uh, the lake and we're doing the lake's unlock quest, which involves this turtle, some fairies, and uh, the master of the lake, as they refer to him. And these penguins, these comedic relief penguins, which we won't see again. Sadly, there's some really good quests involving them. Cause, cause, cause yeah, I mean, the. the all the three shorter speedrun categories, I want to say, only really show you maybe about 25% of everything the game has to offer. So, um, yeah, there are some yeah. other, you know, non-main quest lines that have, you know, that arc through all of these stories or these opening quests. Uh, the penguins have a good, you know, four other quests, possibly five if you count Where's Putty. Um, and then, you know, Gilbert's entire quest line. Right. Yeah, there's just a number yeah. of kind of quests and subquests that that explore even more of the world. Yeah. An analogy I like to use for that too is that if you think about most RPGs as being kind of like a movie, uh, this game is kind of more like a TV or anime series where the focus is just a lot more on uh, on sh kind of shorter stories with recurring characters mm -hmm. uh, between some of them rather than just one really long story that ties everything together. Yeah. But yeah, this, there's the good comedic relief bit there, where they the, they try and get the captain to threaten them properly, 
because the, cap, the captain doesn't want to, because his mama said the word kill is so, so strong, so mean. Um, and this is a rare occasion where we actually use STs on mob fights, just because those Chopin Hood enemies are pretty tanky. Yep. And their AI, just the AI for this particular fight just works out nicely. That you're not, you don't really have to worry about the enemies walking away and not getting hit by the Veilstrom. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing with Blamo and Luan, uh, again, for our Chobin Hood's mass amount of health. All right, so these ya these yaks, which we'll be fighting of a couple times, are pretty big jerks sometimes. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, like this. <laughs> yep. The, kind of the most obnoxious thing about these yaks is that if they use, if they hit you with their tongue attack, that turns you around. So you have yep. to it's just you get disoriented a little bit by having to uh, reposition yourself before attacking again. Yeah. Any enemy that uses a, a moving or deformation style attack is is one to be wary of. If it moves, if it changes your sprite in any way, it's usually bad news. Is it fair to say that yaks are jerks? Yes. A little. <laughs> um, so the, the, this, this cutscene here always makes me smile, just because this uh, you have your character doing some kind of cartoonish gestures to get around the fact that they don't speak at all outside uh -huh. of one very special occasion in the yeah. Jimmy storyline. I like this one because it's kind of like, yeah, don't you kill the monster? And the, your character's like, what, me? Kill a monster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we would probably start talking about the Gorgon Eye boss fight, too. Um, this boss fight uses a really unique um, stun lock uh, setup. Um, where, cause no, I don't think we've really seen it much yet, but if you just press the light attack button, you'll normally do a three hit. Because if you mash it straight up, you normally do a three hit combo where you do, uh, you, do two kind of, you do two hits with a pretty fast animation and then a third hit with a long recovery time. And then... The, the optimal way to stun lock organize is actually to do the first two hits of the uh, light attack combo, hesitate for a little bit to reset it, and then rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the rhythm for this is pretty tight, and it's pretty challenging to kind of lock it down completely without it ever actually doing anything. And we do not want it to do anything because this boss... Uh, it's much like Spriggan, honestly. It has a teleport, but the teleport's also attached to an ST, so you lose another 10 seconds when it uses the ST after the teleport, right? It, both of its attacks are very wide. Uh, one of them can stone you, which is a status effect you cannot deal with. Um, yeah, and then after you've done about like a little over a bar of damage with the short combos, then you, you do, you, you'll stun Gorgonite and you can do power cancels for faster damage. And that was perfect. perfect. That was perfect, Good yep. job. Great Gorgonite fight. Always nervous about that one, more so than any of the run killers. It's messing up that combo. Well, more than yeah. more, more than Irwin? It's the harder uh, combo. No, maybe Ir Irwin's worse, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it's the harder combo. Irwin's just for so sure. deep, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we got one last bit of pirate comic relief. They try to build a bridge up, and it's not good enough for the turtle, and. Now they've failed to build a bridge at all. <laughs> and the Firefly Lamp, which is usually very important. Uh, it will be important for us later. All right, so um, the next fairy storyline quest that um, Lemur is going to be doing is... Um, um, in Search of Fairies, mm -hmm. which also takes place uh, at Lake Kilma, which is why we had to do Gorgonai first. But we can't just go directly back into Lake Kilma. Um, we actually we have to go back to Gato Grottos to activate In Search of Fairies by talking to Matilda at the temple. Mm -hmm. And because we have to come back here anyway, we're going to be using this opportunity to do a side quest. That's It's not related to Fairy Storyline. It's not required to unlock any part of Fairy Storyline. But doing um, Niccolo's Business Unusual 2, which is, which is a really, really short quest because of the fast travel for the, uh, for the dungeon area here, will get us, just get us an extra artifact. So do, just doing, doing the fairy storyline quests alone isn't going to be enough to get us to 18 artifacts for being able to access the final quest. So uh, we'd make, we make use of just a few opportunities here and there to do, fast, to do short side quests to get, um, to get additional artifacts. And uh, I guess, Lemur, unless you had anything, we could probably squeeze in a few uh, words from Blaze here while we're uh, taking Niccolo to look for some green balls. 
Yeah, this is a great time. All right, sounds good to me. We don't have any new donations at this point, but uh, we did just finish off the last incentive for this run, so I wanted to let everybody know about the uh, incentives that are coming up for the next couple runs after this. Um, so the run immediately after this is Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. There is a bid war to save or kill Legolas. Uh, one of those is canon. Uh, and speaking of uh, messing with the canon, uh, there is also a bid war to choose who the ring is stolen from. And it says, via glitches, instead of Frodo, Boromir can steal the ring from any member of the Fellowship, including himself, except Gandalf. So uh, you can donate for those bid wars uh, right now for the next run. Uh, and then I also just want to tell everybody a little bit more about Nami. Nami serves as the preeminent resource for people searching for life-changing guidance information and support as they navigate mental health conditions. Their website alone serves more than 12 million unique visitors annually. Jeez, Lemur, you have the exact position. I spent like a good hour like trying out exact positions there to find the right place and you, you were just always at it <laughs> for, for waiting for that fairy. If you touch the log that the fairy appears on, she won't show up. You have to not be too close to her. Um, to get her to show yeah, up. And then and le leaving the screen and coming back at yep. one point too also speeds up um, finishing the quest. But yeah, I did a bunch, I did a bunch of stuff to try and find the legendary, like you can stand far enough away to talk to her. And the, oh, like to just mash basically. Just, yeah. yeah, and it's it's just it's just a little too far, but Lemur has basically the right position to be as close as you can be. It's just like, just has it. Yeah, it's still pretty tight to get. I mess it up mm -hmm. sometimes. The, yep. the big thing that helps me is counting the number of times that bottom left Nicolo appears, which yep. shout out to Monocled again for um, uh, mapping out that strat. <laughs> yeah, the, the the audio for that sequence does it for me. Like every every four moves, it kind of creates one shuffle of movement, right? And then at X many, right, like you know it's time. Yeah. So the first half of In Search of Fairies is kind of a repeat of the Gorgon Eye as far as going to the north shore of Lake Kilma and just doing the exact same series of fights. It's just there's no cutscenes with pirates or uh, turtles until, yep. we, until we actually get to the uh, the shore. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you really want to have good kind of be, be, have a good handle on how to do spins in, in, optimally by this point too, just because Fighting a lot of these enemies with um, other 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 attacks is pretty pretty slow and inconsistent. Yeah, as as mentioned, where like spins the only real AOE basic attack we have. Uh, so even if you can quickly kill them in kind of like a, a heavy and then a, a heavy and then a jump, right? Like that's still slower than killing all of them with four spins. Right. Little, yeah, unfortunate timing on that level up there too, because yep. yeah, leveling up because mm -hmm. like like um, Mecha said earlier, it's about there's about a five second delay when you level up before a fight can end, and if you level up off the literal last crystal <laughs> you pick up, and that's maximizing Oof. the time loss. So let's see. somehow that spin still went off. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, Is, yeah. But there's what I think two more yak fights uh, before the end of this place. So hopefully we'll finally see a good yak fight. Uh, two haven't been too cooperative. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, this one's a bit easier because, yeah, I guess that's something we didn't call attention to yet, too, is that you're invincible at the start of every fight for a few seconds. <laughs> and, okay. All right. The are not <laughs> giving it to me today. No. Yeah. This one in particular is usually a little easier because you start the fight closer to the yak, and you're, so you're still invincible when you start attacking it. But, yeah. Okay, we got one more chance to hopefully see a, uh, a fast yeah, 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 kill. But this is Dana, which we get to inter interact with properly here. Also, if you like nunchucks, Dana. <laughs> we, we've already met the incentive, but, you know, just a little extra sweetener. Mm -hmm. And again, Maelstrom because the Chobin Hood has too much HP. Yeah, and its AI is kind of... It aggroes against you in, in, a, in, the, in a good way to consistently hit with Maelstrom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, despite being a ranged fighter, yeah. All right, now we're about to meet the, the last player in the fairy storyline, who is Erwin. And shout-outs to this amazing sprite work, too, both for his, his body and his face portrait. Yep. You want to talk about uh, who Erwin is and what he did? Right. So here we get kind of the elemental powers you stole is kind of the key thing here. 
Um, and we're gonna skip kind of the next lore quest anyway, so it's a good time to talk about how 10 years ago, what, ha what happened in the mines was that uh, Erwin and Matilda both kind of ran away, right, like at Matilda's behest. Um, and Scott chased them because Scott assumed that, they, you know, Erwin was going to do something bad, or like when he was alone with her. And there's a cave collapse. Uh, and in the cave collapse, right, like now, where like both of, both her and Erwin are yeah. stuck. Actually, we should probably pause yep. that until after this boss. So this no. is Boreal Hound, who's the, uh, the second um, really random boss in the run besides uh, Spriggan. So yeah, kind of kind of like um, Spriggan, Boreal Hound can just kind of jump around and uh, make it hard to actually get hits. Also, ow! Yeah, there was an awoo in the PSX. You awooed without me? I am offended. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we should have warned yeah. you. So, um, so, so Lemur's going to be primarily using jump cancels and sometimes power cancels, depending on where Boreal Hound is, to kind of try to hit a blind spot, basically. Mm -hmm. But That's you can see Boreal Hound kind of leaping over some of the strikes, right? Like, and if it, it ever gets loose, uh, like that, yeah. That we're going to see some STs. All right, so we get a counter ST here, doing its Metal Sonic attack, as I call it. Yeah, that's a good one to counter ST. Very easy to, mm -hmm. to get in on. Nice. Yep. That's that's good. A yeah. one ST Boreal Hound with the with the good ST. He has some full screen clearers that take a lot longer and can easily hit you. I've never personally understood why they decided to put Boreal Hound here instead of in the snow area, but uh, my best guess is just that somebody at Squaresoft was really, really, really proud of their work on that boss and decided to put it into a required uh, storyline quest instead of a completely optional area. Yeah. All right, uh -huh. so I guess back to talking about the uh, about the the, the mm -hmm. cave in and the mines. Yeah. Um. So, <clears throat> right now, uh, one of the wisdoms is going to give Matilda a talking to about her future, but we're still talking about her past. So she and Erwin were trapped deep in the mines, and she was kind of like, I don't, I don't want to be a priestess, right? Like I, but I don't like, I don't know what to do here. And she's like, you know, and Erwin's like, well, summon your spirit. I like that your spirit can probably help us find a way out. And when she does. Erwin takes it and says, you know, if you hate, you know, having your power, if you hate everything here, right, like, then let me take it from you. And steals her elemental powers, which is why she looks so aged over the last 10 years, um, which is, you know, why, and that cave -in is why, you know, Escod is dead. <laughs> that cave -in plus when the power was taken, and that power is what's allowing, uh, what's allowing Erwin to do what he's doing, right? Like he is using her power in addition with his to influence, to become the master of the fairies and eventually, assumedly, do something meaningful. Yeah, and then kind of was alluded to earlier, um, the next quest, um, Polkiel Dream Teller, is meant to be a really big lore dump about uh, where we're actually gonna see this, uh, yeah. these events that Mecca was just talking about, about um, um, Erwin and uh, Matilda bonding and then leading to her to him stealing her powers mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, kind of fortunately for us unfortunately for the game um, we're actually able to just fail this quest because um, once once we've um, talked to Polkiel, one of the one of the six, currently six wisdoms and, and gone into uh, gone into the dreams basically we can actually just choose to just leave and um, that will mark the quest as a failure on our quest tracker and the menu system, but uh, because you can never get permanently locked out of any of the uh, three major story arcs in Legend of Mana, despite failing this quest, we're still allowed to continue on in the quest line. Yep, and that that is Escott at his teenage angstiest, which is honestly, <laughs> you know, his best, all things considered, <laughs> um, that we saw briefly there before we noped out. And now we're on to Starcross Lovers. Mm-hmm. Yep, and this is where the uh, the incentive that you generously uh, donated to me is going to come into play too. After we uh, after we head back to kind of our home base for the fairy storyline in the uh, the Temple of Healing, we're going to talk to Matilda, and then she's going to be uh, kind of spirited away by uh, by the fairies to uh, to the Bindus ruins, which is where the actual quest takes place. Mm -hmm. And One small note here, we have the two torches quest is when you're supposed to see the difference between Dana and Escod. This is where you get to see the interaction between Matilda and Erwin, Star Cross lovers, right? So those two quests are both meant to kind of define the core pairings here. 
And um, I guess we could probably, I mean, we could probably squeeze in a few words from Blaze here too before <coughs> we before we actually get to the uh, to the Escat fight, which is going to be a little different than uh, than how this would work in a uh, in a normal speed run. Yep. Go yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so just really quick, I want to remind chat, if you awood, you have to pay the fine. So I am waiting for those donations. Uh, we don't have any new donations at the moment, but I just want to quickly uh, shout out um, and send thanks to the people involved in our foreign language restreams. Our French restream can be found at twitch.tv slash lefrenchrestream and our Japanese stream at twitch.tv slash Japanese underscore restream. If those restreams can help you enjoy the marathon, go check them out and send them some love. Yep, and yeah, we see here some very kind of closed off Irwin uh, behavior. And shortly we'll be back in the scene because the fairies don't want us interfering. Yeah, there aren't really a lot of cutscenes in this game where your character isn't there. Because, I mean, your character is a silent protagonist, but they're just kind of always there as far as uh, kind of helping. Uh, Helping guide events in motion. Yep. So we basically just we're just we're this is this is a much shorter segment of the ruins than when we were here for tea time of danger earlier, and we're a lot stronger. So these um these three fights here are pretty trivial at this point. Yeah. Also, how many squares away is the ruins from from this? It's only is it one or two? Uh. I think it's just one actually. Is the ruins uh, from where? From, the ruins from Gato. Uh, two squares away from Gato. Okay, so I want you to remember that in about uh, five seconds. We know Escod wasn't teleported. He's two days travel away, <laughs> and yet, <laughs> and yet. All right, so we only need to unlock one of the gates this time, and then we're actually able to talk to Niccolo here to fast travel to the uh, Tower Tower of Winds, I believe it's called. Yep. That's where the boss fight is. And we see the switch into Counter Strike. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, Counter Strike is um, it's it's one of the best melee attacks in the game. I believe when you have a one-handed sword, it's a six times damage multiplier, and then with a two-handed sword or hammer, it's times eight. And then uh, Lemur's going to pick the first option here, which normally is a really bad idea. Not the best fight in forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because in a, in a normal run, you would want to side with Escad because you get a lot, you save a lot of time on dialogue later on. But uh, whoever you fight here, kind of the general strategy is the same. You're kind of trying to get them into the corner and do uh, counter strikes. Mm, good cutting bamboo. Oh, there. nice. Yeah. Well done. Nice. Not bad for not having done that fight. In yeah, the, uh, he wasn't really playing with yeah. the counter strikes, but that cutting bamboo kind of finished the job. Now the real question: Do we take Dana to Leucemia and let her <laughs> screw up everything there? <laughs> yeah, well, that's your call. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> we do. I mean, we we just we just we just said we were going to side with her and spare her life. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, here there's more there's more cuts there's more text boxes here than there would be if Escod was with us. Um, that's the first bit of, of time loss. The second bit comes uh, after the fairy arc is completed. Um, so yeah, like ultimately it is a bit of a time loss to take Dana, which is why it being the first option is is the punishing <laughs> one because you're, you're, you're just jamming and then suddenly, nope, actually <laughs> second option, please. Yeah, like one or two of my early fairy percent PBs did that. So. Yep. It's because it's, it's what it's about like 40, 45 seconds in total or so the mm -hmm. time loss from siding with Dana. Yeah, it's the, the yeah, roughly. Yeah, that, the the extra text in the in the ending is the real killer. Like that extra text is a little annoying. But there's extra text both here when we pick this up and then in the ending. Right. So, All right. So <clears throat> right now we're actually we're, this is going to be our final trip um, back to Gato to initiate the final quest of the fairy storyline, Heaven's Gate. So we're, we're going to get the artifact for um, Leucemia, which is, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll talk more about that later, but just Leucemia is just one of my favorite set, like, in a visual and musical set pieces. It's a fantastic set piece. On the whole, really on the whole PS1, much less this game alone. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, So we're going to put down Leucemia right, right away, but we're not going to go there quite yet. Um, and uh, there are kind of two reasons for that. Um, 
we're putting it down now to set the land and mana levels because there's a lot of combat in Leucemia. Like, just, I don't know, probably somewhere, like at least 15 fights, I want to say, if not closer to 20. Uh, and, the, and then Erwin is the final boss of Fairy Storyline at the end. So we want to kind of try to level down the, uh, the, the enemies as much as possible through both the, giving it the, as low a land level as possible, which we're going to achieve by putting it down now and also putting it down right next to our house, which are the two factors we can control. And then um, and then we're gonna go on and do some other stuff in order to get, kind of both fulfill our um, 18 artifact requirement to get to Cage of Dreams, the, the start of the end game, and also to get access to a leveled up shop that we can use to buy gold weapons at. And then ha having the gold weapons is going to also make, speed up the combat in Leucemia a lot. Yeah. So yep, now we're going to see the placement of Lusamia. Yeah, and kind of like the if you were reading the te the uh, unskippable text during the uh, intro to Heaven's Gate, uh, Lusamia is an ancient worm that uh, almost basically almost destroyed the world before deciding to munch on a volcano and then dying from indigestion. And um, it's it basically it's it's a dead dragon kind of hard shell that's still floating and. Um, Erwin is, Erwin's kind of master plan is to, I guess, use Matilda's stolen powers to re resurrect Leucemia to, to cause apocalypse or something. Yeah, I mean, it essentially has revived the worm. It killed itself last time, but the worm is alive now. And yeah, he's the way that Erwin phrases it is that he wants to destroy the humans who have taken so much from the land. That's how he's going to put it. But we're just a little suspicious of that motive. Yeah. So he's putting down the broken doll that he got from doing Niccolo's Business Unusual 2, which is the next area we're actually going to. But then, yeah, set down the, uh, the desert, too, which is part of the overall routing. Yeah, just another relatively short quest that gives us another uh, artifact <coughs> in place. Yeah, this will be, be number 17, I believe, out of 18 that we get from doing this quest. And then the 18 is the lantern that we have sitting there. Well, 18 is the Trembling Spoon. Oh, all right. Oh, I guess this would be 16. Yeah, then, this would be 16 then. Okay. Have, yeah, if we don't actually have the lantern yep. yet. Uh, yep. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're kind of entering into that, like, cleanup phase of the run, I like to say, mm -hmm. where we've, you know, met all the prerequisites to complete Fairy, but we haven't met all the prerequisites yeah. to complete the game yet. Mm -hmm. Both Fairy and Dragon have a cleanup section like this. Um, Jumi is painful enough that you actually have extra AFs <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> yep. It's just another, like, like, um, like, Bruxel said, that's part of why it's, it's one of the longest choices. Yeah, so again, we could, Lemur could have just gone directly to Leucemia, but it would be a lot slower and more difficult if he did so now versus later. Yeah, with that, the extra hammer isn't, the extra hammer and or sword uh, is another 10 power. If it's the hammer, it's another 20 power. It's, yeah, it's the sword he uses for Heaven's Gate and yeah. the hammer for Legend of Mana. Okay. I, I'm a hammer user in general because mm -hmm. of all, all events, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the, the sword. This is one of the nice things about this category, too, is if you want to route it out with just solo hammer, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, I do think it might be a touch slower than the sword, but not by much. It yeah. is a bit more of a playstyle thing, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. The, the Dubula fight is a nightmare with the hammer. That's I, I don't think yeah, you do that yeah, fight with the hammer no matter what. <laughs> now but. we have the real boss of um, uh, this quest, which is the item collection after the, after the final <laughs> yeah. fight. Too. Yeah. All of those little coins. Yeah, because, yeah... It, it, Part of why we pick this uh, this quest for our uh, side quest oh. is that yeah it's, it's it's really fast to get to the boss room and then because it's just a mob fight instead of a real boss we can we can just wreck them with a maelstrom followed by a spin yeah and I, I guess tying back to weapons too I mean um, one of the, just one of the things that I just love about Legend of Mana as a speed game is that just because different weapons are more optimal for different categories in the game. Um, that just that that, ma that, ma that just makes the play style slightly different, and just and kind of keeps keeps it fresh and exciting to uh, to run different categories. Because like for very, very percent here, we're seeing you do um, you start with a hammer, then you use a one-handed sword for a big chunk of the game, then you go back to a hammer for the end. And then like for uh, dragon percent, you use a two-handed sword for most of the run, and then like Jumi percent is 
I believe it's just a hammer start to finish. And then, then if you do a long category, like all stories or all events, you actually get to build your own weapon. Yeah, that's my, that's my favorite part. <laughs> um, but yeah, we saw, again, we saw placing a land adjacent to Lusamia there. We're doing that for the same reason we did it near the mines, to modify the levels of the enemies inside. So we even get to do a little bit of that to make Lusamia easier for us. But now it's Lumina or Roar in Japanese. And it's actually, if you have Japanese language on, that it doesn't say Luma, it says Roar. <laughs> um, but now yeah. we get to meet Gilbert. Yep, then we get to sell some lamps. Yep. So we're about to do, um, it's called um, Fairy's Light in the PlayStation version and Spirit's, Spirit's Light, Light in here. the remaster. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a quest that's just purely um, kind of uh, dialogue and uh, and uh, event triggers. There's no actual fighting. And learning a language. Yes, you get to, get to Break out your uh, Rosetta Stone skills. So, um, and this quest is actually done in every single category of this game for various reasons. Um, the reason we're doing it in Fairy Percent is to get to get, it, to get the Trembling Spoon artifact, which will be our 18th. Uh, but it's and the, but it's also just to be to have a high level town um, so that we can buy gold equipment here. Yep. So here's time. Here's your Dud Bear. All right, Dub. Dud, dubba, duda, dubba, bubba, dada, gaga, Blech. it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. We got Gak. <laughs> got, we, Gak we, don't want to, we don't want to see Gak, though. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically, the, um, Gilbert the centaur is kind of trying to woo a, uh, a, a harpy named Monique by helping her sell uh, lamps to these dud bears. <clears throat> dud bear basically means not a bear in their own language. And, um,. Fortunately, the uh, the responses we have to give to these t t to these um, to these bears are the same every time. Yeah, two mm -hmm. two one one three one 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 three and two two, two, two one three. three. Yep. Um, it is worth noting that if you actually write down all that dud bear, like what they say does make sense, mm -hmm. right? Like you can legitimately that's how you're supposed to do it, right? Yep. Another ten power here, switching back to spin jump, and getting blocked by the dud bear a little. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and every, that bear can be a jerk. He he really likes blocking you out there. We're also t taking advantage of an exploit here too, where every time we sell one of the lamps to a dud bear, we get a thousand lucre. Lucre being the currency in Mana Series games. And even though we, the, the money belongs to Monique or and and or Gilbert. Um, while we have the money, we can spend it with no real lasting consequences. Yep. So we're we're kind of robbing uh, robbing Monique to buy. Uh, 2,000 lucre worth of weapon upgrades. Well, I, I think we're robbing, um, like, I don't think Monique would be like, what's this? Like, you sold all my lamps and you only got this much money? I think we're <laughs> robbing Gilbert, and okay, I'm fine I, with I'm that. I'm fine with that, too. Yeah, <laughs> Gilbert's, Gilbert's a bit of a jerk, as we're yeah. about to see here. <clears throat> yep. Then, um, a little, just a little minor note here, too. This this cutscene's actually a little different in the speedrun because of the game being widescreen now instead of um, 4x3, like in the PlayStation version, because... Uh, on the uh, PlayStation version, you'd, you'd have to you, you can you'd have to approach this cutscene from a certain angle in order to stop the camera <coughs> from panning over to start the cutscene. But because it's widescreen now, it's just a total non-issue. And mm -hmm. there's a couple other uh, impacts on the the game and the speed run from the widescreen transition. Like there's a couple rooms and dungeons where you have fights that are very close together, and you can take advantage of the widescreen drawing to. Um, Kind of move into the next fight trigger while you're still in the previous fight. Yeah, or an, another couple scenes where there's a pan before the com before or after the cutscene, where the the uh, 16 by 9 main, means less panning. Right. Uh, we've got a moment here. Do you yeah, if, can maybe do like one or two quick uh, plugs or something. We're gonna have about a five minute <coughs> cutscene after Heaven's Gate that uh, we'll have a lot of time for. Uh, for stuff during, but yeah, during the quick, we could maybe just squeeze in one or two at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a, a $10 donation from friend uh, Gambit017 that says, oh no, I actually forgot to a woo. Here's double the tax. And uh, <laughs> sounds like we've got a long cutscene coming up. Uh, chat, I need help with my dud bear. That went way too fast for me. So if you want to send me in some uh, dud bear uh, language learning assistance, I would really appreciate it. All right, so Lemur's putting down the last artifact of the run, the Trembling Spoon. If we were doing Dragon Percent or any other category that requires doing Dragon Storyline, 
We'd be doing this way, way earlier because this is the underworld, which is where you start the dragon storyline and where some of the key plot points for it happen. But for our purposes, it's just our 18th land as far as um, being able to finish the game. And here's the Cancun bird. Yep. For some reason, we have access to it now. Nobody really explained why. Yep. Nor will they. All right. So, yeah, so now we're actually going to Leucemia now that we've met the rest of the requirements to be able to finish the game afterwards. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is this is just such a gorgeous set piece for, it, a, for a dungeon in an RPG when we're on a floating dragon skeleton. It, just... it looks just as good in PSX. Like, they, they tuned up the HD, but, like, this background moving, like, none of that is new, right? Like, it's just... Higher just easier now. to see, and just and also the, this music is so so good too. Yeah. Like I love how um, Shimamura gave the uh, the three major storylines their own kind of motif theme for mm -hmm. it. Like this like this is the theme of the fairy storyline, which we heard during most of the cutscenes um, um, that took place in Gato. We're hearing a different version of it for Lucemia, the final dungeon. It's it kind of segues into Irwin's boss fight theme, and then we get kind of a more subdued version for the uh, the closing cutscenes afterwards. Yeah, and I think I honestly think this version of this theme is better than the PSX one. A lot of the, the music I think is a little better. I think this is a lot better. Um, I think that this it was a huge like the, the music was always great, but mm -hmm. this this really helps bring it up for me. Yeah. So this is where we kind of get our payoff too for a lot of the routing with the land placements too because it's like like there's there's a ton of mob fights here and uh, both the land levels and then also the mana levels that we set up um, um, for leucemia are just kind of lowering the health of these enemies as much as possible. Yeah, one heavy hit or three spins on the skeletons, right? Like <clears throat> two heavies and a spin on the narcissus, right? Like these are just very good low numbers to have. Right? All right. Like, so right here is, um, this is one of our few opportunities to actually kind of skip something in the run. Yeah, unfortunately, uh. Lieber didn't get it. There's, there's two, there's two about six second cutscenes that can be skipped through, um, kind of approaching uh, Selva, one of the wisdoms from the right uh, angle, then just wiggling to clip through. The first one is much, much harder because uh, there isn't a, a, a kind of a buffer or consistent setup for it. You just have to uh, have kind of a, a good, get establish a visual cue and then try to hit it. But uh, it's 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 really hard. And again, it's only about a six second time save. So. Uh, like mo most most runners will just make an attempt at it, and if, if they don't get it, they just talk to Selva and get it over with. Yeah, F's in chat for uh, the for the Lucemia battle skip. Yeah, yeah. And in, in the place in the PlayStation version, um, one it was possible to skip one of those fights that the first of those um, fights after Selva that uh, or second. I'm second. sorry mm -hmm. that. Uh, after that uh, Lemur did. Um, and that's, it's kind of exploiting a glitch with how two battle zones overlap each other. But uh, I, I understand why Square fixed that in the remaster because if if, if you run into that casually, you're so, you're going to get soft locked because mm -hmm. uh, you you, don't, you have to know that you how to clip through NPCs in order to actually get out of it. Yeah. Additionally, if you trigger it before the battle's actually over, you're dead. Like you can't kill the enemies. You're just kind of stuck there. <laughs> so yeah, no, it, it deserved a fix. It's just. Sad, it's just sad, after, it. especially <laughs> with all the work Lemur put into uh, setting, finding a good yeah, setup for that. it. Uh, mm -hmm. For a long time, it was considered even by speedrunners to be, you know, a soft lock. Like, hey, be really careful on that fight, or you'll just lose the run. But manage to find a solo clip you can do through one of the enemy models there, and that kind of changed it for the speed run. Yeah, because it was because it used to be thought that you had to have a partner with you in order to uh, yeah cl to cl I just just to clip through NPCs period consistently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then Lemur found a uh, kind of a Wiggletron setup for doing it solo, and then for the Selva skips as well. Selva skips were also doable with a partner. Um, but doing them without a partner is harder, but okay. doing you, you can always clip through an NPC, but it usually takes like five, ten seconds for the game to give it up. All right, and there, yeah, that was a really nice there, second that, Selva yeah, skip, too. We saw a good Selva skip there. Yeah, right. the, se the second one is easier because you, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a consistent setup for it, basically, where you just kind of go straight uh, up and right so when you uh, come onto that screen. That just lines you up really nicely to, uh, to do the wiggle to clip through. But yeah, the game has it has clipping as like an escape valve, um, and you actually have to do it in uh, one of the quests that we're not going to touch today. 
because there's like 15 sprites on the screen blocking your way. There's just no way you could get through there if there wasn't some sort of innate clipping. But usually it takes a little bit, right? Like, or a lot of NPCs to trigger it. And so finding, you know, finding ways to clip through enemies without, or sprites without it, it was a huge, uh, you know, contribution by Lemur in this, or like in this area specifically. But, uh, when the when the trumpets swell like that in the music it always mm -hmm. gives me goosebumps too yeah and that like i don't think that that swell hits as hard in the psx version it's there but man shimamura <laughs> never not good mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is the final approach um we've got two more fights here and then we'll be at at the final showdown with Irwin. yeah yep. So we could probably just start talking about the Irwin fight too. So all of the the final bosses of the three storylines all have unique music and really kind of awesome sprite work and complex AI. But uh, Irwin does have a bit of a uh, a bit of a pretty major exploit in how his um, kind of re recovery from getting hit by power attacks works. Where um, basically just if we do kind of a do a power chain with the with the, with the right rhythm, um, he's not gonna he's not gonna break out of it. So Lemur's just moving straight to the you right. Can give it a jump that yeah. really messes up the chain, though. So we got to see. Yeah, so he moves straight to the right to All get right. in a good position. Then hopefully Irwin just jumps to forward, and then let's see what happens. And that bass line in the background. Oh. Go ahead. Oof. Go ahead and turn it up. Yeah, that's the weird jump. Uh, mm. Yep, yeah, he's gonna uh, get one. Up there. Uh, he's gonna get one. Yeah. And one usually means two, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, let's see if Cunning Bamboo can interrupt. No, uh, just a little bit right. early. Uh, oh, unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. So now we'll see his his uh, Dragon Ball Z attack. Yep. Yeah. Generally, if you see this attack, you kind of want to try to hang out in the corner of the screen. Mm -hmm. I believe there's enough randomness with where the energy balls go that it's uh, kind of there isn't really like a total safe space. So. Yeah. You can dodge it in either corner, in the middle of the screen even. This is what we wanted to see. Yeah. Just another power yeah, cancel right. block. Yeah, that's what it was supposed it. to look like at yep. the beginning. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Very, very nice recovery. Because, yeah, you saw that the the hits there are taking us below 50, right? Like another barrage of ST, and right, we could have been in real danger. Yeah. Well... Not that wasn't great for the uh, for the run, but it was it was good as far as letting people hear more of this awesome music and kind of see some of the cool animations and stuff. Yep, but, uh, the head bobbing in the background there, just yeah. like yeah, just how Irwin's kind yeah, of. The yeah, unfortunate thing about the Irwin fight is there's like one or two things he can do at the start of the fight that just really screw you up if you don't react to him right away. Mm -hmm. Typically on that push, if you stay still, you can attack him before he gets his second hit in. But that mm -hmm. time, I think I was just a little bit too slow on it. Because yeah, like nine out of ten times, you just as long as you just head straight to the right to get into the fight trigger um, and just wait for Irwin to jump forward, you'll 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 have a great position for doing the power cancel chain or to kill him before he does anything. Mm -hmm. All oh, right, yeah. so I guess maybe Mecca, did you want to just kind of just quick summarize what's happening here with the end of the fairy storyline, and then yeah. we can turn it over to Blaze for a bit. Sure. So the big thing here is. We're like, oh wait, no, Dana's not here. Do we not? Do we get to skip this because we didn't take Dana? <laughs> no, there she shows up. Okay. Okay. So here we're about to be told about how Matilda passed away, right? Like while we were out there. All right. And then we're going to see, right, like in this game, we haven't interacted with the underworld. Beings that are just dead or still cling to life can hang out in the underworld. Um, for some period of time, or in or, uh, S. God's case, for you know over ten years, um, and we're going to see uh, Dana. We're going to see uh, Matilda and Erwin, you know, act out kind of the last, the last act of their of their star-crossed lovers arc for us, um, as the fairies talk about their ancient war. Um, so yeah, like this music, the final music is great. Pay attention to it, but we can uh, have some some. Uh, Blaze has some time here as well because this is just a long forced cutscene. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I just have to say, I'm really enjoying the run and the music. This has been fantastic so far. So, uh, great job so far. Uh, getting to some donations, we have a twenty dollars donation from Hotbot that says, "Is this enough for the Awu fine? I don't want Piplup to take me to Limit Break Jail." <laughs> 
Uh, and then we have a $25 donation from the Axeman that says, Dubba Dub, Dab. <laughs> Uh, and while I have a little bit of time, um, I already talked about the Bid Wars coming up for the next run, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, there's two Bid Wars for that run. Uh, I want to look a little bit further ahead, uh, coming up a little bit later today here at RPG Limit Break 2022. Uh, we have a donation incentive for uh, Super Neptunia RPG uh, to choose the voice acting language between uh, English and Japanese. Uh, and then we have some incentives uh, for Hylix 2, which is coming up later today, including two bonus incentives. Uh, for $500, uh, our runner will do the arcade minigame during the Hylix 2 run. And for $1,000, this one sounds really cool to me, uh, during the Hylix 2 run, uh, the runner will do a first-person perspective dungeon and boss. So, you know, you didn't know you were going to get some FPS action here at RPG Limit Break, but here we go, coming later today with Hylix 2. So... Um, and in addition to donating, uh, I just want to remind everybody that the Yeti is back and the awesome t-shirts are back as well. They're here for another year, courtesy of the Yeti. That's Y-E-T-E-E -E -E at theyeti.com slash RPGLB. And the Yeti are donating $5 from each shirt sold to NAMI. So go check them out. Go see if you find one that looks cool to you and get yourself some fantastic RPG Limit Break swag. And uh, we got a nice, uh, Lemur, I want you to know as well, there is a nice, healthy crowd here in the room here in Salt Lake City. Uh, they are rooting for you. They have been enjoying this run. Let's have a nice round of applause. We got the end of the run coming up here and let's bring it on home. Thank you everyone for showing up. Yeah, and, and you can see this here, right? Like Erwin is still kind of closed off and conflicted and Matilda's trying to reach out, right? Like to try and get him to understand that we're like, he had a positive inf influence on her life that she wants. And, you know, he just keeps bringing out these ways that he can't possibly relate to her. And she's just like, no, really. I, I, <laughs> I need to free myself from a spell, spell named, named Matilda. <laughs> I think the other power line from this is I am the universe. Oh, wait, be gone, Chad. Yeah. Was, yeah, no, that's a good one, too. <laughs> and this music, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, vo the, the vocals, the, the vocal good lab. edit for the remasters, just, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do have to admit, I do like the PS1 version of Leucemia a little mm -hmm. bit better, but for this one, I think it's no contest. And see here, even, he's like, I can't hug you because I'd crush you. And she's like, no, no, like, these bodies are fake, right? You can do that. And then he's just like, nope. Just, just a bit crushing and, there. And, and maybe just another yeah, thing to hard, note. Which is more heart-wrenching, this ending or the, the Jumi ending. Yeah. Both are yep. pretty high up there in my book. But since, yeah. but since we're talking about the music, too, by the way, if you, do, uh, if you haven't played this remaster, you should, by the way. And also, you get to pick your soundtrack, too. Um, if you if you want to do the original music, you can. Plus, there's a whole sound test of the entire soundtrack. So, if if you don't have the CD like I do, uh, by all means, <laughs> you know you can get the game. Yeah. All right. So um. All right. So now we've met both of the requirements to be able to finish the game, which are to have placed 18 artifacts on the overworld and then to finish one of the three main storylines. And. Um, now we're going to be starting the end game, which is just basically kind of a, just a series of two quests. The Cage mm -hmm. of Dreams, which gives us the final artifact, the Sword of Mana, and then, the, and then Legend of Mana, which is uh, where the final boss is. So, yep, for some reason you have to go into home twice, once to move the triggers forward for the quests, and then the second time for the quest to actually start. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, once we, once we see just the adorable little cactus, who I'm proud to say I have a plush of back home. Same. Um, talking to uh, the Sproutlings, which are these kind of plant-like uh, creatures that we see kind of in towns all throughout the game about, uh, kind of about, basically about just life and death and the afterlife. Um, then we know that we're, uh, we've initiated the end game. We have to go into our house and back oh. out. And I think that's because of this, uh, this, this scene with the uh, with the mail delivery pelican kind of needing to be cleared out before well, we can... we also, the leaves don't show up until you do that. Ah, uh, gotcha. So you're stuck with both, so you just have, you get introduced to Amulet just barely, and then Cage of Dreams. So I guess while we're just, 
another quick another quick thing to note too while we're in this cutscene before starting Cage of Dreams is that another option in the remaster is that you can actually turn off random encounters. That's something new they added, which is kind of nice for uh, being able to uh, get through dungeon areas a lot faster. But for the uh, for the for the rule set that um, Lemur is using for the for this speed run, we're not allowed to use that. Um, we're we're, it's, we're basically just kind of treating it the same like the PlayStation version, where that's not a, a, an option at all. Mm -hmm. um, there are there are categories that that do allow you to use the no encounters option though. That's true. Uh, basically, we we just feel like the texture of the game is a little less when you don't have any random encounters. It does change the route significantly though. You you lack ST bar, you lack experience, right? Like it does change what you have to do. Yeah, or in Dragon Percent, you have to Some figure out how to get no weapons. Encounters yeah. are very very scary. <laughs> yeah. So like yes, it lets us get through things faster, but it doesn't necessarily make the the, the hardest stuff easier. But. All right. So we're basically we're just this kind of just a short quest where we're inside the dream of one of these sproutlings who's kind of been imprisoned there by uh, blanking on his name, but the. Uh, the state, the kind of the floating stained glass, no, Nunazak, yeah, yeah, the floating stained yeah. glass window NPC. Mm -hmm. You get to learn, you get to interact with Nun, Nunzak a little more in yeah, uh, in, in Jumi. Jumi but, yeah. yeah, there's all this, there's lore in the game about him, but we don't actually care because he's just a jerk getting in our way. <laughs> yeah, another thing I like about this game too is just how the the, the NPCs, like the major storyline NPCs, all have are all very visually distinctive from each other, and none of them are really throwaways. Too, like pretty much all of them show up in multiple events. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're so we just have four kind of four fights, um, and then we get the Sword of Mana. Um, Lemur switched to the Gold Hammer, which is going to be his weapon for the rest of the run, since I believe it does more damage with spins. And, um, and and also more damage with Counter Strike, which is what we're going to be using yeah. on the final boss. But we, we were doing the sword for Leucemia, I think, m primarily for the Irwin fight because it has a faster swing animation, and uh, we need that in order to get the stun lock. But uh, just I think it the Irwin fight, and then also a lot of the mobs have like big spreads of XP that can appear, and so having the sword movement speed to quickly pick those up helps a lot. Yeah. But oh coming yeah. Here into the end game, we really want the Counter Strike damage. That's another good point too. That yeah, the weapon you have on affects your movement speed in battle, mm -hmm. and also wiggle running, which we talked about way back at the start of the run. You can also do in battle. It's a little less. It's a little less visually obvious too. Uh, but in battle, it's also a little more obviously good. In battle, you essentially have a long, faster step and then a slow follow-up step. In that, and just those two repeat as you try to move. So if you move in a straight line, but wiggling in battle lets you reset those, so you can take part a piece of the fast step, you know, diagonally each way, right? So yeah, people casually will stumble upon that wiggle just because the movement is so <laughs> so slow uh, yeah. with a slower weapon. But yeah, you have fists and and flails are very are the fastest, then you have swords and such in the middle space, then you have hammer and spear and such, and it's these slow, slow movement weapons. Yeah. It's right here. He said the thing. He said the thing. We know it's getting serious because the name of the game gets said. Yep. In the Japanese, this, that, that header thing is just in quotes, mana. <laughs> yeah. So um, we could talk to uh, Pulkiel, the wisdom there, to get a little bit more lore about the mana tree, but um, um, we're not going to. So... Uh, for the, the, the mana tree isn't really that long for being the game's final dungeon because again this game I, I just it, it's kind of more about the uh, the side quests and the uh, the mm -hmm. short storytelling more than about um, kind of the end game that wraps it up yeah. there is a route there like if you go right on the previous two screens ago you can you end up in an unnecessary encounter so there there is an encounter we get to skip because the tree provides two ways to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. so just there did a counter strike to, to to pretty much take that dragon down to like 1 HP and then a regular attack to finish it off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, counter counter strike just you you, pr you press the button and then you go into a defensive pose then if an enemy uses a melee attack on you close by then you do a really really strong counter attack that uh it's going to one-shot most of the regular enemies on the mana tree, and then it's going to be our main method of damage against the mana goddess, the final boss. Yeah. All right, so got one more fight here. and then There's we're our only be... chocobo. Yeah. Oh, wrong direction. 
Yeah, there you are, we go. This game does have a pet system, too, that we didn't actually touch in the speed run, but you can actually get your own pet Chocobo or Rabbite or really insert favorite Mana series uh, monster or demi-human type. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're, now we've kind of reached the top of the tree and we're going into the Mana Sanctuary now. Um, the Mana Sanctuary, is, it's a three by three grid and then there's fights at the four corners of that grid. And then in order to progress to the final boss area, we have to win those four fights. Yep, in any order. And the grid is completely connected, right? Like uh, Manhattan style. So you can go north and east and west and south in any part of the grid. Yeah, what order you do them in is there's, it's, it kind of, I, I think it kind of varies a little bit depending on like um, what category and weapon you have. Like, um, like I like doing it in this the order Lemur is in uh, very storyline because then you're positioned really cleanly to uh, lunge into the yak and then set up a counter strike on it. But um, mm -hmm. but like in other in some other categories it's a little more optimal to go north from the and do the northwest one instead because then you're set up better to use spins on the enemies in that screen. Mm -hmm. And also, like, if the enemies drop crystals in one position or another, right, like, you want to pick up those crystals and then get off the screen, right? So, yeah, and, but whether counterclockwise or counterclockwise, yeah. you're, you're usually high enough power and high enough level here that there's there's no challenge yeah. here. And that all ties into just what, what just why, because I really just love this as a speed game so much too, is that this game has just tons and tons of depth to the, uh, to the, to the map and battle systems that just doesn't really matter that much playing it casually because the difficulty isn't really that high. But when you're uh, really trying to optimize your battles, it's, just, it's really cool, really technical and really challenging. Mm -hmm. All right, and with, all right, and with that, it's time to fight the Mana Goddess, the final boss. Um, so the Mana Goddess is, um, is, a, is a humanoid sprite, kind of like Esgad. So in general, when you're fighting a humanoid-style boss, Counter-Strike is the way to go. But getting Counter-Strikes on the Mana Goddess, is, is, it's, it's pretty challenging. It takes, takes a lot of skill and practice because she dances around and also does attacks, I believe, that have slightly different hitboxes as far as where you need to this, be. This is a set piece that very much improved in the HD remaster, being able to see more of kind of the, the night sky of trees, right? Like the cosmic tree background. Is... Okay, and Boom. I love how, how long the hitbox for Counter-Strike sticks around, too. Yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah, funny. She's, she's dancing around in bad ways. Uh, first ST. So yeah, after about three regular attacks, she'll do her first ST. Lightning. Depending on what she does, it might work out to try to do a Blamo ST of your own when she's coming out of it. Oh, by the way, also time is going to be when Mana Goddess's health bar hits zero. Yep. So I think about two, maybe three two more CSs. hits. Yes. <clears throat> uh, now it'll be it'll yeah, be what, third. one more hit and there, time. time. She gave you the business that first the first section, but second one you yeah, managed to reset up. Some very happy feet that fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Looks like you got a one thirty eight thirteen with which getting the extra right. data dialogue is an incredible time for a live performance like this. Um, that yeah, it's really really good. I guess just to wrap up the the mana goddess fight too. So you see the eclipse in the background. That's kind of a, a kind of a built-in time limit before she'll do a really dangerous st that um, has a really long animation too. And that's part of why we do Counter Strike is to uh, um, to be able to do damage fast enough to largely guarantee winning before the eclipse happens. Yeah, you never. Yeah, you and never typically, if you get hit by that, you're going to die because you're normally getting at least hit once or twice by the goddess during the fight. So if she gets off that eclipse move and it hits you, you're probably dead if you're doing a single storyline category. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess do you have any uh, <clears throat> any shout outs or anything, Lemur? Uh, yeah, I mean, big shout out to the Legend of Mana speedrun community, including Pwixel and Mecha here, uh, Monocle, Elevated, everyone there. They're super supportive. We're always looking for new runners, and we always want to help you learn the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to give a shout out to the Limit Break staff. So kind of a coincidence, but on this day three years ago, I took my first world record in Legend of Mana, and at that time, I never thought I'd be on a stage like this or anything. You know, I watched Quattropus's run that he did at Limit Break some years ago and thought that was a pipe dream. So thanks for having me today. Oh, our pleasure. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, I, being somewhat of a newcomer to Legend of Mana, like, what, like, about 
October of last year or so, I did my first run. I yeah, also agree wholeheartedly that it's a really awesome and welcoming community that uh, super supportive and helping me learn how to uh, how to run this game. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I guess uh, I guess if I guess if this looks interesting to you at all too, just uh, mm -hmm. but is the speedrun.com page for Legend of Mana the yeah. place to go as far as finding the guides and the Discord yeah, link and everything? Yeah, go to the speedrun.com page. Uh, check out our Discord too. That's a great spot to ask, and anyone will chime in to help you out. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is like a really good speed game to get into, and it has a good learning curve too. You know, it's really easy to start, but very difficult to master. So, I think if you're looking for a game like that, this is definitely for you. Yes, and it's also not terribly long for an RPG too. Yeah, if you do true. one of the shorter categories, like uh, yeah, like Dra Dragon Percent, the shortest one is generally even at a very beginner level is still going to be under two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, if you do like the longer categories, right? Like we go all the way up to like I said, right? Like all stories, right? Like get the most of the plot in like four a uh, sub four right like if you you know all, all events is at six you know platinum is at 10 right like if you really like those longer categories they're there for you here too there's a lot more content in this game uh and casually playing right like you have higher difficulties there's a game new game plus options so yeah there's just a lot here for anybody that that is interested in something like this whether you like fighting brawlers or rpgs this this game has or, or good, has things really good music too. Yep. <laughs> it has or crazy that. crafting systems. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, the crafting system is great. <laughs> no notes. Okay, maybe a few notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess anything else before we head out then? No, that's it for me. Uh, thanks again. All right. All right, thank you again so much uh, to Lemur for, again, I dare say, that legendary run of Legend of Mana HD Remaster. Up next, we will have, uh, for the next run, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Any Percent by Pete Dore. Uh, we're going to be throwing it to an ad break before then, uh, but I just wanted to uh, sign off here very briefly. My name is Moonblaze Wolf. I've been your host for this last run. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great time. Uh, this is the end of my hosting duties for the marathon, but I will be back later tonight for LM Motas's uh, Loom Run, so definitely check that out if you're looking uh, for a nice, cozy, dare I say funny late night run. Uh, and when we get back from the ad break, you will be left in the capable hands of Sam without a plan here at the hosting desk at RPG Limit Break. Uh, I'm fairly confident in saying Sam does in fact have a plan and that is going to be to continue reading your donations and guiding us through another uh, fantastic afternoon of speedruns. Let's keep on donating, let's keep on supporting NAMI, and let's keep spreading the word about this event. Thank you everybody.